When you go to the beach and maybe you're building a sandcastle or you're um, just, just enjoying the nice, beautiful white sand that we have uh, on, the, on the Gulf Coast, you know, when you're, when you're working with the sand and you're trying to build something or, or your kids or your grandkids are, are playing with the sand there and, and, and you're working and some sand kind of works through your fingers and falls back to, to, to the shoreline there, like you don't think much of it because, you know, a little bit of sand filters through your fingers and off of the shovel or out of the bucket. It's not that big of a deal because you have so much sand to work with. And, and similarly, you know, when... When, when you're using words and you're using thousands of words a day and you're using tens and hundreds of thousands of words a week, a, a few misplaced words, a, a few lost words, a few words that um, m- maybe shouldn't have been said or that came out the wrong way, you know, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal in the broad scheme of things because you're using so many <laughs> But I'm really excited about this current teaching series called Words Matter because we're, we're realizing that, no, even a few lost words, a few misplaced words, a few words poorly spoken, a few words that get away from us, you know, it's, it's not like sand at the beach because these words have consequences. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and we're, we're discovering and rediscovering, being reminded of the fact that our words carry tremendous power, and we do use a lot of them. The average man using about 14 to 16,000 words per day. The average woman using about 20,000, 18, 20,000 words a day. And it's amazing with all the words that we use, we never really get fatigued when it comes to our speaking. You know, the average sermon is about 5,000 words, which means today, after both of our services, I will have used just 10,000 words before lunch. And I will not go home this afternoon and say to my family, oh man, my tongue is so sore. Isn't it something, you know, the tongue is really a compilation of muscles. Isn't it something that none of you have ever gone home in the evening and like, man, you know what? I think I pulled a tongue muscle today. (laughs) You've never gone to the doctor and said, doc, can I get an MRI here, man? My tongue is killing me. I'm having a hard time talking. Now, maybe some of you thought about someone else in your life that they needed to go to the doctor and get an MRI so that they could have a little break from talking. But isn't it amazing? All the words, we used to think about this, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of words in a week, and our tongues never get tired. They never get fatigued. And unlike sand that's, you know, kind of falls through our fingers, no, a few misplaced words, a few inappropriate words, a few words that get away from us, no, they they can have a tremendous impact. And when you think about the number of words that we use, just the sheer number without question, every single time that we talk, we are in danger of saying something that would be hurtful to someone else. And so this week, I wanna give you a simple principle that comes out of God's word, comes out of the Proverbs. That's really the foundation of our, of our teaching series. Just a really simple principle that I, I, I think is really foundational for us. It's this, that an abundance of talking leads to an abundance of trouble. An abundance of talking leads to an abundance of trouble because words matter. Even a few lost words, a few lost phrases, a a few words that get away from us that we say maybe even in the wrong tone, in the wrong spirit, words about someone else, words that are deceiving, words that are hurtful, words, just a few words that get away from us can have a significant impact. And we have to be mindful of this because we use so many of them, an abundance of words leads to an abundance of trouble. An abundance of talking leads to an abundance of trouble. Now, this is true for at least two reasons. First of all, we have to understand that we have a word problem because we have a heart problem. We have a word problem because we have a heart problem. 
And when you put the number of words that come out of our mouths with the deep-seated sin that's in our hearts, it's a really bad combination. Let me show you a, a scripture from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and it is incurable. Now remember what Jesus taught us, that it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. When you put together the amount of words that we speak with the sinful hearts that we possess, it's a very dangerous combination. An abundance of talking leads to an abundance of trouble first and foremost, because our words follow our heart and our hearts are deceitful and they are incurable without God's help. And so we are hardwired to use our words in an inappropriate, hurtful manner at times. We have a word problem because we have a heart problem. Secondly, uh, just the sheer number of words is evidence in conjunction with our evil hearts <laughs> that at some point in time, we're gonna say something inappropriate, hurtful, about or to someone else. You see, when you combine our nature with our number of words that we use, it's another bad combination. And that's why the Proverbs really help us to formulate a response to the words that we speak in such a way that we're encouraged to use less of them because an abundance of talking leads to an abundance of trouble. And we're rolling through some of these Proverbs. Let me, let me give you just four out of the gate here that I think will encourage you to measure your words and perhaps even to use less of them. Because again, when you combine the sheer number of words with our nature, which is sinful, it's a really bad combination. So the Proverbs help us with this. Let me give you four examples. First of all, Proverbs 10 and verse 19. When there are many words, sin is unavoidable, but the one who controls his lips is prudent. Now notice there, the Proverbs help us to understand that when there are many, many, many words, sin is unavoidable. Not sin is in the background, not sin is uh, available. No, 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 sin is unavoidable. When there is an abundance of talking, there's an abundance of trouble. When there are many words, sin is unavoidable. Let me show you Proverbs 17. The one who has knowledge restrains his words and the one who keeps a cool head is a person of understanding. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent, discerning when he seals his lips. You can take the dumbest person that you know and don't point to anybody, okay? You can take the dumbest person you know, put them in a meeting. If they sit there with a discerning look and they say very little, they might just be perceived as wise. <laughs> I love this proverb. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent. Let me show you Proverbs 21, 23. The one who guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. And then Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And so we are reminded that our words can get us into trouble and that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Last week, we saw that our words can be used to either inform, injure, or inspire. And we talked about the importance of use, using our words to build up, to build others up, to inspire, not injure. This week, I wanna encourage us to not build up, although we need to keep doing that, by the way, but, but this week's focus is hush up. Now that's a cleaned up pastor way of saying shut up, but I didn't say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm saying hush up. We need to use our words less frequently. We need to be more careful. The Proverbs are so crystal clear on this. Why? Because an abundance of talking leads to an abundance of trouble. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent. Where there are many words, sin is unavoidable. We need to measure our words, use less of them. Let me give you one more example. Proverbs 30 and verse 32. I love this. If you have been foolish by exalting yourself or if you've been scheming, put your hand over your mouth. 
I know some of you are like, okay, pastor, did you just, did you just come up with that and attach a Bible reference? No, 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 that's in the word of God. If you've been foolish by exalting yourself with your speech, making yourself look better than you are, tearing somebody else down, or if you've been scheming, put your hand over your mouth. I think duct tape would be an appropriate application of this verse of scripture. (laughs) Hush up. Listen to what the Proverbs are saying. We need to use fewer words. We need to be very discerning with the words that we use because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we use our words so often to injure and not inspire. And so we need to build up with our words. But you know what? There are a lot of other times we just need to hush up. When we're scheming, when we're prideful, (laughs) when we're angry, we do well to put our hands over our mouths. And the Proverbs highlight several examples of where we just need to hush up. This is all throughout, not just the Proverbs, but the Bible. Let me give you five areas where we need to hush up. Five like critical areas where we we often use words to get ourselves or others into trouble. First of all, the issue of lying. Deception. The Proverbs have much to say about this. Let me give you one example in Proverbs 12. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue only a moment. Deceit is in the hearts of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace have joy show you what Jeremiah says here, talking about the wicked. Their tongues are deadly arrows. They speak deception, lies. With his mouth, one speaks peaceably with his friend, but inwardly he sets up an ambush. You know, lying, deceiving is a huge part of how we use words to hurt others and also hurt ourselves. It's an area where we need to hush up, put our hands over our mouths. Lying is a critical area of growth, I'm sure for many of us, if not all of us. And you know, lying is is something that we often demonstrate from the earliest of years. I'll never forget uh, early in, in my uh, in my parenting, you know, my wife and I have four kids and our, and our middles, our, our second and our third are only 18 months apart. Yes, I know, I know, I know. And, and, so, um, and so we had a fun run there. We, at one point we had, you know, like three kids. I mean, they were like, I don't know, uh, four and under or five. I don't even remember. It's all a blur. But uh, my middles, I'll never forget when my, 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 my second, my, my, my firstborn son, he, he, he was um, about three years old at the time. And, and, and my, and my uh, second daughter, his, his sister, just 18 months younger. She, so she's one is somewhere in that range. And um, something, I remember something was missing from her room. And uh, we were looking for this thing, it was gone. There was, you know, like a mess in the room. Something, it looked, looked like somebody had broken into her, her bedroom. And I'll never forget, I walked in there and my son's in there just kind of wandering around aimlessly. And, hey buddy, hey, do you know what happened here? Nope. Well, man, who, who took this and who, who, who made this mess? And I will never forget, he looked up at me, looked at his sister who was in her crib at the time. Her. And I'm like, buddy, she's in Alcatraz right now. You know what I'm like? She's one. She's behind this crib, okay? And like, I just love like in his little three-year-old mind, he's thinking, okay, dad will totally go for this. She hopped over the crib. Okay, she, she, she was like Mary Lou Retton. Okay, I know a lot of you aren't gonna get that reference. Okay, um, okay, she hopped over the crib, got down, made a mess of a room hopped back over the crib and then she was just standing there, right? And then that's just such a silly example of, you know what, like we don't have to teach kids to lie. We don't teach kids to deceive. We don't teach adults. But, but you think about just all of the damage done to relationships, even our society through deception and lie. People covering their tracks. It happens at early ages and seem, seemingly uh, harmless ways, you know, cute ways, but I tell you, it happens older in life in, in critically damaging ways. That's why, you know, I teach my children, I would rather hear a bad truth than a good lie because the good lie always catches up with you. 
And the Proverbs help us to understand that one of the ways our words get us into trouble is when we try to cover our tracks with lying and deceit. Our tongues are like deadly arrows in those situations. With, with our mouths, maybe we speak peaceably with a friend, but inwardly setting up an ambush. We're using our words to harm someone else to protect ourselves. Lying, deceitfulness is a huge part of how our words get us into trouble. Secondly, let me give you another area, gossiping. Proverbs have a lot to say about this. Gossiping, using our words to tear others down. Proverbs 11, with his mouth, the ungodly destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous are rescued. Proverbs 20 and verse 19, the one who reveals secrets is a constant gossip. I love this. Avoid someone with a big mouth. <laughs> Again, I know what you're thinking. All right, Corey, you, you just put that in there. No, 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 that... That is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Avoid someone with a big mouth who's always talking, tearing others down. There's danger there. I love that. That's such a helpful verse. Let me give you one more, Proverbs 26, 20. Without wood, fire goes out, and without a gossip, conflict dies down. Avoid someone with a big mouth. I love that. Gossiping. Hurting someone else, tearing them down, again, maybe even to their face, um, building them up, setting an ambush, though, with how we use our words. Lying, deceitfulness, gossiping, injuring others. Let me give you a third area, arguing. Kind of a good old-fashioned Bible word for this is quarreling. (laughs) Someone who's argumentative, quarreling, just constantly uh, agitating. Proverbs 26, 17, a person who is passing by and meddles in a quarrel that's not his is like one who grabs a dog by the ears. <laughs> Proverbs 26, 21, as charcoal for embers and wood for fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. Hey, can I give you just uh, maybe a helpful word here? Y- you know where we see a lot of quarreling today? Social media. Like I told you last week, I mean, it's not just words now like coming out of our mouths that can get us into trouble. It's what our thumbs type, or for some of you, your fingers type, or you're on your keyboard. I I, I tell you, I see so much foolishness on social media. I don't know, when I was younger and less wise, maybe, I, you know, I would try to engage every now and then. You know what I realized? There's just, there's just no convincing people who are just dumb. You know, because when I'm scrolling through, you know what? I know that I'm right. Do you all have the same opinion of yourself, right? I know I'm right. And in my mind, my arguments are clear and coherent. They are biblical. They are Holy Spirit inspired. And there are all these other people out there, thousands of them, and they apparently don't have the Holy Spirit. And so he has entrusted me with the burden of convincing them that they are morons. And so, you know, you go after it. And of course it doesn't work, right? It's a horrible platform for trying to have an intelligent conversation. <laughs> because every, you know what I've learned? Everybody is a brave, fierce warrior behind a keyboard. <laughs> It's just, you look at our culture right now, it it is amazing to me how much arguing or quarreling exists. I tell you, watch television, I used to have news and now you just have debates. I mean, it's true like this in the sports world, you know, go Bucks tonight, I'm all in on the Bucks. You know what I like, you turn on the TV and what, you know, you, know, you, you turn on something in the morning, you're listening to the radio. So often, what do you have now? You have shows designed to where you've got two or three or four different vantage points and it's, you're, you're presenting your case. And, and we just kind of as a culture, like we find that engaging and it's, it's, it's just, you know, some of it's fun, but you know, a lot of what we have culturally, it's just flat out arguing, quarreling, people trying to convince other people that aren't gonna be convinced. And then when you get on social media, you see it on Facebook, Facebook, I can't tell you how many times, you know, it, it's just, I've just seen foolishness. And, and the scripture speaks to this as charcoal for embers and wood for fire. So is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. That's a danger of how we use our words. Let me give you another fourth kind of category that the Proverbs speak to here, where we just need to kind of hush up and be more wise. Manipulation, manipulating others. We use words in that way, try to get our way. Proverbs 26, 18, 19, check this out. Like a madman who throws flaming darts and deadly arrows, so is the person who deceives his neighbor and then says, ha, I was only kidding. (laughs) 
Proverbs 26, smooth lips with an evil heart are like glaze on an earthen vessel. A hateful person disguises himself with his speech and harbors deceit within. When he speaks graciously, don't believe him for there are seven detestable things in his heart. Though his hatred is concealed by deception, his evil will be revealed in the assembly. There's manipulation, a certain type of deception there. I have to say, I've been guilty of this. I'll give you an example in my marriage, you know. <laughs> for years. I mean, I still have to wrestle with this temptation, you know, especially early on in my marriage. And, you know, I'd, I'd find that, uh, that sale on a certain golf club at Dick's Sporting Goods, you know, and it's ninety nine ninety nine. And in a moment of weakness, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get it. And then I, I got to go home and tell my wife that, okay, I spent a, well, with tax, like $107 on this golf club, you know which when you're buying diapers and everything else, and you know, there's a time like this, uh, I don't know, but it's golf. So, you know, again, I think it's of the Lord. So, um, you know, so I'm, I'm good with it, but I got to convince her to be good with it. And so, and so I don't know, guys, you ever done this? So you go, she said, all right, yeah, I got this golf club. All right, well, how much was it? About $90. Anybody ever done that? Anybody ever round down? <laughs> In my defense, I'm not wrong, about $90. And then banks ruin my life with online baking and then she can just go to the app. Well, why is it 107? Oh, honey, well, I mean, there was a little bit of tax on there and it will, oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry, I forgot. It was 99.99, about $90. You ever do that? Honey, how much is that new car? I love these people at Christmas time that go out and buy $75,000 Lexus. You, just, you like the one commercial, these people are like 18 years old and they both have a brand new car. You like that one? That's my favorite. Hey, here's an $8,000 car. Hey, I got you one too. Great. <laughs> you know, y'all, they look 18 years old. Y'all know the commercial I'm talking about? You ever go buy, buy, buy a new car? It's 50, 49 nine, right? About $40,000, baby. It's about $40,000, right? You round down or you round up. You use where you manipulate a little bit. You fudge the numbers. You, 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 uh, you, you kind of twist the words to, to get what you want. Let me give you one last category, rationalizing. This kind of brings everything into focus, rationalizing. I love this. This isn't about words per se, this proverb, but check it out. It kind of, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Proverbs 21, two, all a person's ways seem right to him. My ways and my thoughts seem right to me. They make sense to me. Your ways, your thoughts make sense to you. They seem right to you. All of a person's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs hearts. And the problem with all of these issues, right? Lying, gossiping, arguing, manipulating, rationalizing, it's right to me. You know what they all boil down to? One central issue, self. Self, they all boil down to self, every single one of them. Again, we round down, we round up, we deceive, manipulate, talk down about others, make excuses, justify our bad behavior while being judgmental toward others, rationalize, vilify in an effort to what? To make ourselves look better and make ourselves feel better. The power of words. Words matter. We use our words in these ways. They injure. These are all ways that we use our words in destructive ways. Ways that can ruin relationships, ruin testimonies. I mean, isn't it so often the case that, that, that there have been people whose lives, whose careers have been ruined, not because of what they did, but because of how they tried to cover it up. They just come out and owned it right away. The consequences would not have been as severe. We teach this to our children. The cover up is always worse than the crime, but we use our words to round up, to round down, to manipulate, to deceive, to talk down, to make excuses, to justify, to rationalize, to make ourselves look better and feel better. But at the end of the day, all we're doing is causing more harm, more damage. And so what do, do the Proverbs teach us? What does God's word teach us here? We need to put our hands over our mouths when it comes to these areas. We need to avoid people in our lives who have a big mouth, 
whose words get them in trouble, get us in trouble, drag us down. And, and here's the thing, we, we, we have to take a long look at our hearts and understand out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we're, we're always going to be tempted to make ourselves look better and feel better. And you know what the Christian life helps us to understand? This is the beautiful freeing thing the Christian life is ultimately not about us, it's about others. It's not about building me up, it's about building others up. It's not about puffing myself up by tearing others down so that I feel better. You know what, it's, it's understanding that I am created by a wonderful, loving, gracious God who sent his son to die for my sins and rescue me from hell. And therefore I have intrinsic value and worth because of him. I don't have to tear people down to make myself feel better. No, no, no. I am loved, chosen, redeemed, accepted because of what my savior has done for me. So you know what I can do? I can cheer on others. I can delight in their success. I, I, I can encourage and inspire. I, I, in other words, let me say it this way. I, I can be constructive and not destructive with my words. It's okay. When we, that's why I told you last week, our words problem, even this week, is ultimately not a words problem, it's a heart problem. When you, when you combine the sheer number of words that we use with the natures that we have, we, listen, it's a bad combination. That's why we start with our natures. We start with this all-encompassing, freeing love of Jesus that, 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 that welcomes us into his family that motivates us and inspires us and leads us to be others focused and others centered and ultimately Jesus focused and Jesus centered. When that happens, here's what we do. We, we, we begin to measure our words. We begin to hush up a little bit, speak less. We, 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 we focus on not being deceptive or quarrelsome or manipulative. No, we, we, we try to leverage our words to build up and to be constructive and not destructive. That's huge. Let me show you just one one slide here that we put together that I think kind of encapsulates this. Here's the shift. When you come to Jesus with your heart and you accept his redeeming love into your life and the fact that you are a child of God and you are fully loved and accepted. You know what I mean? Like, like when you have that and, and it frees you, look at this, to, to take something like anger and replace it with a graciousness. To hush up on the left and to build up on the right. So we instead of instead of using words in an angry manner, we use them in a gracious manner. Instead of using them in a complaining, grumbling kind of manner, we we use them in an uplifting manner. Instead of being harsh, we're tender. Instead of being resentful, we're kind. Negative, positive, judgmental, no compassion. Instead of using our words to gossip and tear others down and to hurt them, we speak words of blessing and instead of being critical, we encourage you. Just, these are just some examples of how I think the Proverbs help us to formulate words that, that build up, that inspire. In order for that to happen, we gotta hush up and really give attention to these areas that are so destructive. I'll give you one last example. I move into the, to the first century here. We're just after the life and ministry of Jesus, get into the days of the New Testament, right? And you see the church beginning to minister and serve and you see the apostles beginning to work in a powerful way. And there's a man who comes into their lives whose birth name was Joseph. Now you won't recognize him by his name, Joseph. You won't recognize him by his birth name. You, you recognize him by his nickname. Some of you are wondering right now, who is this Joseph? A friend of the apostles a key servant of the Lord, a key leader in the missionary endeavors of the first century. He didn't go by Joseph. You know why? The apostles gave him another name. They gave him a nickname. And his name, his nickname was Barnabas. And you know what Barnabas means? Son of encouragement. You know, they would often name people back then based on something that stood out about a feature or a person. You got this guy named Joseph and he began to associate with the apostles, he began to serve the Lord. And this guy was such an encourager. He was such a blessing to be around. He was such a positive energy and a positive force. 
that the apostle said, you know what, we're not gonna call you Joseph anymore. We're gonna call you Barnabas. We're gonna go, we're gonna call, hey, you see my friend encouragement here? <laughs> That's what it meant. Hey, let me introduce you to my good buddy encouragement. And they, they changed his name. You don't know him as Joseph, you know him as Barnabas. You know what I would like to be known as? Thor. I would love for people to see me, me like, <laughs> You remind me of Thor, <laughs> but that's never gonna happen. <laughs> Do you know what all of us have the opportunity to be known by? Seriously, think about this, just with the power of our words. You say, you know, I'm not the most educated. I'm not the, uh, you know, I'm not the most talented. Hey, join the club, you know what I mean? Hey, here's, you know what we all have the opportunity to be known as an encourager. There's nothing given to us like about Barnabas. It's like, oh yeah, man, that guy's life, it, it, that's out of reach. He's just a normal guy who loved the Lord and used his words to encourage and inspire. And I'm not kidding you. The apostle said, we ain't calling you Joseph anymore. We're gonna start calling you son of encouragement. And when we see him in heaven, you know what we're gonna call him? Son of encouragement. Nobody calls him Joseph anymore. Call him Barnabas. Now, that's the kind of person I wanna be. How about you? You say, do words have power? Do words, do they have lasting value? Man, you better believe it. It changes the trajectory of people's lives. And so let's, let's be a people, especially in this day and time, with what we say, what we type, what we post. Hey, let's be a people who are constructive and not destructive. Are you with me? Let's be a Barnabas. <laughs> And I believe God will use our witness in a very, very, very powerful way because in our day and time, we need a lot more Barnabases out there. And as we strive to make that kind of an impact, I'm telling you, the Lord will use it in a profound way because words matter. And death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit and we can, we can make a very, very profound impact.